turn in the Word of God tonight to Psalms 48. We'll just begin there, and this may take me a while to develop and walk through here. I want to so much preaching, but I told you I want to tell you about Jerusalem, and uh, I want to explain the significance of Jerusalem to you. You've heard that in the news this week, I'm sure, that the, uh, you know, the United States, that's a big deal for us to acknowledge before the world that Jerusalem is the capital. Of course, we all know that it's the capital. Uh, but us acknowledging it makes a difference. And the reason it makes a difference is the fact that they want to put the embassy there. And we'll talk about why uh, that's important. We'll try to get to that. I'll try to go all the way up to 1948, uh, May 14, 1948, and look at that. And just a lot to this city. But I just want to begin here in Psalms 48. The Word of God tells us, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God. There's no other city that God's put His name on uh, outside Jerusalem. And so that in itself makes that important. That is God's city. It's not Washington, D.C. You think it might be Cameron, right? But it ain't. I can't believe that. But it's not. It's right there at Jerusalem. And because that's the city of God, it makes it very important. Because he's claimed that for his city. Out of all the universe and all of creation, uh, he's chosen the Jewish people as his, the apple of his eye. And he's chosen out of Israel, out of the land of Canaan, which is from the river of Egypt, which is the Nile River, to the northern river, his other boundary, which is the river what? Euphrates. And all that is the land that he promised to his children. Uh, to his chosen children, the Jewish people. And so, out of that land, there's one place that he put his name on and put his stamp on and said, this is my city. And that makes it important. If nothing else tonight, that makes it important. So, let's have a word of prayer. Dear and Father, I just pray you help me uh, tonight, Lord. Uh, just go through your word a little bit, Lord Father, we're learning a little something tonight. And I pray you'd help our hearts, Lord. Encourage us, Lord Father, uh, God, through this message. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for it. We ask you all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, as you go through the Bible, you'll notice that there's three uh, Jerusalems, right? Y'all read the three Jerusalems, right? Okay. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. That's right. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4 very quickly in the New Testament. Kind of bring some, uh, uh, just to kind of help you with this. In Galatians chapter 4. <coughs> Now let me show you what I mean by three Jerusalems. Now it's prominent uh, from Genesis with the first occurrence of the city of Jerusalem. And we'll see it at the very end in the book of Revelation. But in Galatians chapter 4, the Bible tells us uh, in verse 25, are you with me there? Galatians chapter 4, verse 25. Here's some pages turning. That's good. All right. Everybody read it. Amen. 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 People's there. All right. Galatians. Chapter 4, verse 25 says, For this Hagar, and this Hagar, that's Hagar, that's the Old Testament Hagar, which was a handmaiden from Egypt uh, that bare Ishmael from, of course, Abraham, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answers to Jerusalem, which what? Now he is. Good. And is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is what? Above. Is free, which is the mother of us all. Okay? How many Jerusalems we got there so far? Two. Okay, we got one more. Revelation 21 1 is the third Jerusalem, which is very important uh, as well. And we even mentioned that, I think, this morning. And it says. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven was passed away for the first, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, what? Amen. New Jerusalem. How many Jerusalems? Three. 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 One below. That's Jerusalem we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. There's one above. It is now, right? Okay? And why is that important? Because that represents, uh, and just as... Jerusalem down here represents, but not in its perfect form. Jerusalem up there uh, represents the perfect, the, the salvation. It's the temple. It's the where the Lord Himself uh, sprinkled His precious blood on the mercy seat. And we'll talk about that, which is a replica of Jerusalem down here. And then there's one to come. 
And that's the New Jerusalem. That's the home of the saints. And that's in the book of Revelation. So uh, those are uh, pretty important just to keep that in mind as we're talking about Jerusalem. Now the name Jerusalem means foundation or possession of peace. It's often referred to there in the Bible, you'll see it as the city of David. You ever read that in the Bible? The city of David and Jerusalem is the same thing. There's another name that's often called in the Bible, and it's what? Mount Zion. Mount Zion. The uh, city of David. Jerusalem. All these places, when you hear those things, they're all the same place, okay? So don't get confused when you read that in the Bible. They're all three the same thing. They're all talking about the same thing. Now, the word Jerusalem is mentioned 767 times in Scripture. I mean, and that's not counting the, re the references to its other names, which we'll look at, but just its name itself, 767 times. Who knows where the first mention of the city of Jerusalem is? Anybody can take a guess? Genesis. Yeah. Genesis. If I ask you first to anything and you say Genesis, nine times out of ten you'll be right. Okay? Because Genesis is the book of what? The beginnings. And the reason it's called the book of beginnings is not only creation and the origin but of man and the origin of the world, but all the major doctrine of the Bible is almost all of it is in the first 11 chapters. The blood, sin, man, all your doctrines, the first occurrence of that will be in the book of Genesis and almost uh, all the important words that really, if you do word studies, you can trace all that all the way back to the book of Genesis. And if you've been in a Genesis class, we've been studying that. Now, Genesis chapter 14 is the first occurrence of this famous city, Jerusalem. Now, if you'll turn into Genesis chapter 14 and try to stick with me as best you can, it says here, the king of Sodom went out to meet him, that is Abraham. Now, Lot has been captured. If you remember taking, uh, being here on Wednesday night, Lot was captured. Abraham, he got an army up together of his servants and some friends of his and the surrounding people that would help him. He went and he recaptured uh, Lot and the residents there of Sodom and he, brought, he brings them back home. And after his return from the slaughter of the uh, Keter Laomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale, and Melchizedek, king of what? Salem. Salem. First mention, that is Jerusalem. Salem means peace. They added the J to it, the J, or the J, which means foundation. So now you have Jerusalem, but the very same place is this Salem. Now, that's the very first mention of it. Why is that important? Because since the time of Melchizedek, who was king of Salem, Salem was in work, the land of Canaan, right? So Melchizedek was a Gentile, okay? He's not after the order of Levi. This is before Levi. Levi is not even a thought now. This is before the law. This is before Moses and Levi and the law is given. Melchizedek holds an office that has never been held by anyone since in Jerusalem. Now he was what? He was king and priest. Never, no Jewish king has ever been priest. No priest has ever been king. King David, he was King David, but he, he never intruded on the, the office of the priesthood. Now that's important. Melchizedek is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ who will one day sit in the throne of his father David again at the end times and he will hold the position of king and priest. And because he does, those that follow him, those that believe in him, you know when he comes back in chapter 19, who comes with him? We do. The church, right? We come out of heaven. We're on what? What we ride? White horses. You ride horses? You will. If you don't now, you will. We come back to earth and we are called a what? What are we called? Now the Bible says, Paul there, he was talking about us and he called us a royal priesthood. And because he's a king priest, we're going to be king priest. Because the Bible says when he comes back, does not yet appear what we shall be, but when he appears, we know that we shall be what? Like him. Okay. So that's very significant in the tracking of the very first instance of Salem or Jerusalem. Now, the next time you see 
the city of Jerusalem or Salem, something has happened. Things have went wrong. Melchizedek is gone. You don't hear of him anymore. Uh, this very special king who Abraham tithed to uh, and it seems like was already knew the God Jehovah uh, even before Abraham knew him, which is why he's a, in the order. That's why Christ is in the order of Melchizedek. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Something happens to Jerusalem. The next time we see it, it's not Salem anymore. It's not uh, the city of peace. It's been captured by a group of Canaanites called the Jebusites. Okay? The Jebusites are heathen people of Canaan. Uh, and instead of referred to as Salem, it is called Jebus. J E B U S I. And sometimes they leave the I off. And you'll see that in Joshua 18.28. So if you fast forward over to the book of Joshua, the second occurrence here of this place, Exodus, and go through the law, and uh, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and you come to the book of Joshua, and Joshua is going to attack and, and claim the promised land that was given to them. Uh, after they crossed the river Jordan there. And in chapter 18, verse 28, it says, And Zillah and Ilith and Jebusiah, which is Jerusalem, okay, which is Jerusalem. And so in Joshua chapter 18, you see that this Jerusalem is now called Jebus or Jebusiah. And sometimes they leave the eye off, depending on uh, when you look at it in the Bible. So Jerusalem. Uh, Mount Zion, the city of David, is inhabited by the Jebusites. Now you won't see much about this city again until the reign of King David. Okay? And over in 1 Chronicles 11, 4, 6, you can turn there, or you can let me turn there, and you just listen. What's ever easiest for you, because we're going through pretty quick. Now 1 Chronicles chapter 11 tells us this, that David becomes king over Israel. Now why is it important that David's king over Israel? Because David is in the direct descendant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, he comes from the loins of David. David comes from the loins of who? You can trace that all the way back to who? Judah. That's why in the Bible they call him the line of the tribe of what? Judah. Judah. Okay, so now you see these genealogies and why that matters in the Bible. And so Judah, not Levi, not Reuben, not anybody, not even Joseph, but Judah is the one who Christ would come through. So that's significant that King David is here. Now if you look at 1 Chronicles 11, it says in verse 4, And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jabesh, where the Jebusites were the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants of Jabus said to David, Thou shalt not come up hither. Nevertheless, David took the castle of what? Zion. Zion. Now you see the first mention of Zion here. Now Zion was a hill within Jerusalem. Okay? And so that's important for you to know because uh, that's why that's where David captured the castle of Jabus was there at Mount Zion. And they call it Mount Zion. And you'll hear Jerusalem as a whole referred to but it's all talking about the same place. Now, the significance of where these hills are uh, makes a difference when you read the Bible. Jerusalem sets on a mountain, okay? One of the most important and most recognizable mountains in the Bible. Anybody guess what mountain it sits on? Mount Moriah. Who said Mount Moriah? Daniel, I've got a some callers back there cooking. You've been a free bowl of Mount Moriah. Now, why is Mount Moriah important? All right, let's turn back to it. Let's turn back to the book of Genesis again, and we'll see why Mount Moriah is important. Genesis 22, one of the great chapters in all of Scripture there, especially in the life of Isaac and Abraham. And Genesis chapter 22, the offering of Isaac. And that was the covenant son of Abraham, whom Jacob would come, and then Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel. And it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, 
whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee. Wow. You see the significance. The first mention, the only mention, of a man being asked to sacrifice his one and only son, his most beloved son, the son of the covenant. He asked his father to take him up on top of Mount Moriah and slay him right there. Now, where was Jesus, Jesus crucified on the hill, right? What's the hill called? In the Hebrew, it's called Golgotha. Right? Okay, you hear Golgotha sometimes in songs and stuff like that. It's, that's the Hebrew word for it. Greek is Calvary, right? That's what it's translated into you, the Calvary. Okay, so uh, you see the significance of that. Abraham found out that the Lord would provide right there on Mount Moriah. You know where Mount Moriah is? Mount Moriah is where Jew Jerusalem is, okay? Christ is crucified where? Jerusalem, okay? And so the first sacrifice there on Mount Moriah, which would be Jerusalem today, points towards the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made at Jerusalem the day shed His blood. The Bible says that Abraham saw, uh, Jesus said that Abraham saw my day and was what? Right. Remember when He said, I am? He said, before Abraham was, I am. Well, now you see how that just tortured the Pharisees. Because I am is the name of who? God. And so when He said, I am, they all knew that He was saying what? That He was God, right? And so it tortured them, right? And so he said that Abraham saw my day and he was glad. What did Abraham see? He saw, he saw, he saw Jehovah Jireh, didn't he? He saw, that he, he saw the God that would provide, didn't he? He saw a glimpse of what? He saw a glimpse of Calvary. He saw a glimpse of the spotted lamb stuck with his horn and his head in the thorns, right? Uh, you see the significance now of the very first mention of that sacrifice and why it's important, why that city is important. Now, you see, as you go forward, and we'll fast forward there, not only was it a place for the first sacrifice, so even from the Old Testament, it has everything to do with our salvation and the recognition of our salvation and where it was and, and what it was all about. You'll notice as you fast forward to the book of Kings, it's a place where the first temple is built, okay? So if you, took, if you fast forward over to 1 Kings 5-5, uh, five, five, and you can go with me if you want, or I can read it to you. <coughs> King Solomon takes the throne. David always wanted to build a temple, but God wouldn't let it. He was a, a man of war, and a man that, that shed so much blood. He said, King Solomon is going to build my temple. In verse 5 he says, And behold, I propose to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build a house unto my name. So he builds this house. He builds the first temple, and where does he build it? Jerusalem. He builds it on Mount Zion. Now why is that important? Because the temple is everything about the what? The presence of God. It's about Jesus Christ. Everything in the temple speaks of Jesus Christ. Everything in the temple is the type of the one that would come. And so you had uh, all these things going on in this little town called Jerusalem. Now it's significant about this, and we'll talk about this a little more, is that Jerusalem, who can tell me what the, the biggest export and the most valuable thing Jerusalem does? You can't tell me, can you? Because they don't they're not rich in oil that we know of. They don't export oil. They're not a major steel manufacturer. They're not, they don't do anything as far as the world would look and say this is an important city. None of that at Jerusalem. It's not on any kind of trade route. In other words, you don't go to Jerusalem to get anywhere. It's like Cameron. If you want to go anywhere, you don't go through Cameron. Because it ain't going to take you anywhere. It's not on a major trade route. It's not the Panama Canal. It's not uh, Suez Canal. It's not anything like that. It's not even on the ocean. It's not even a port city. You can't even sail into it. It's just this little city. And yet, think about this. Every conquering world power has made it a point to go to Jerusalem and wipe it out. Why? 
The Assyrians done it, right? A hundred years later, the Babylonians did it. The, the, uh, Alexander the Great went through there. If not for a dream and God sent him a message, he would have destroyed the temple. He conquered the whole real world. After him, the Romans went through there, right? And destroyed it. It's been invaded by the Turks, the Crusaders, uh, the, the British, you name it. They all want a piece of it. And it's relatively worth what? In the eyes of man. But it's the city of God. <laughs> they can't stand it. It's in everybody's crosshairs. What's so big about that? Listen, it, it, the whole center of the world right now is right there at Jerusalem, isn't it? It always has been. It's not Washington, D.C. It's Jerusalem. It's, it's not anywhere else. It's not the palaces. It's not the kings of any other country. It's all about the Jewish people right there in Jerusalem. It always has been. And it always will be. Okay? Now, this is important. Uh, that all this would be going on in a re relatively insignificant place uh, makes all this, you see, even more important. Now, the temple, of course, would be destroyed by the Babylonians, right? And they would be taken into captivity. The people would. But during the period of Ezra, uh, led by Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua the priest, another Joshua, not the Joshua of the book of Joshua, but another one, they would come back and they would lay the foundations and build temple number. Some of you got that. I, I was not making peace. I was trying to help you out. But some of you still couldn't be here. Fair. So anyway, this is temple number two has been built. Later, some hundred years later, a century later, another man would come and he would finish the walls around. His name was who? Nehemiah, they would rehang the gates, right? Okay? So that's the second temple. You don't hear from this again. It, this, it's destroyed again during the, the what we call the silent years, okay? Uh, which the Bible doesn't record from there from Malachi to Matthew. It's rebuilt again by who? King Herod. It's one of the seven wonders of the world at this time. So that's another temple. It wasn't built by the Jews, but it was built by uh, Herod. It was built by the Romans to pacify them. And so you, uh, they don't a lot of times count that temple, but it's, you could count that as the third temple or not count it at all. But now, today, uh, there's no temple there. Why? Because in 70 AD, who came along and destroyed it for good? The Romans. The Romans under a man named Titus. Now, Jesus prophesied about this in the book of Matthew. Uh, he prophesied that there'd be a time when uh, every stone would be turned upon another stone. And he told that to his disciples, and they couldn't understand what he was talking about. And what he was talking about was that 70 AD time. Now, since then, till now, there's no temple being, has been there. Now, why is that important? Because the Temple Mount, the only thing left is a wall there, part of the wall. Anybody see that wall this year? How about when the president went back to Jerusalem? You see him go up to a wall and pray? That's the original wall. That's all that's left from where it was destroyed. Now what sits on the Temple Mount today? The Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock. It's got a big gold thing. You ever seen that on TV? Okay, that's a mosque. Okay? Now, you'll notice in the book of Revelation, after the church gets raptured up there, and you go on to read through the book of Revelation after chapter 4, you see the church raptured up, and you see things start happening. Jesus said, be aware during the last half of the tribulation, the last three and a half years, He said, be aware that when... Uh, he, this is the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24, and we'll talk about that. The Olivet Discourse is not the rapture. People preach the rapture out of the Olivet Discourse from Matthew there, and it just it bothers me. I just get tore up by it. I just want to stand up. So that's not the... Uh, we're already gone. This is for the Jewish people. If you're not careful, you get confused there when you read that. But Jesus said one important thing to the Jewish people because the disciples asked, when shall these things be? In other words, the end times. That's how this whole conversation and this sermon got started. And Jesus said, listen, when you see what? You need to, you need to check up. He said, when you see certain things, you need to check up because something's about to happen big. And he says, when you see the abomination of desolation set himself up in what? 
temple. The temple. So guess what's got to be re there got to be a temple, right? right? There's no temple there now, okay? So for the tribulation and all this take place, there's got to be a what? A, there's got to be a temple. Okay, you with me on that? Everybody agree on that? In order to sit yourself up in a temple, you need a temple. Right? Some of you look like you don't want to say it's for sure, commit. But you can commit to that. So what does this mean? That means that right there where the temple is, is a mosque. There's no building the temple until that mosque is done what with? Mowed down. Okay? Why is it significant that we build an embassy in Jerusalem? Because that's the beginning of getting that mosque out of there. Okay? Well, when we move our embassy to Jerusalem, that's the beginning of getting this mosque out of there. However they can do it, whether it's politically, peaceably, and I believe it will be that because the Antichrist is a deceiver. Okay? He comes in peace. He makes people think he's all about peace. And somehow or another, he begins to work and get all this stuff moved. And the temple mount is open again. And the temple mount, uh, we put the temple back on there. Okay, when that happens, listen, we can rapture before that. Okay? We can rapture any time now. Between now and the tribulation, we can be raptured out. Everything, there's no uh, set prophecy that says this has got to happen. It's all been, it's all happened. And so, but I do think that we'll, we're able to see some of the birth pains. I believe this is seeing us something that's important in the future. And so, I'm not an expert on that, but uh, I do know some of that stuff. So, now, uh, the reason this is important is, uh, well, let me just turn to all of the discourse, because you really need to understand all of the discourse and understand what's going on here. And... <coughs> Here's chapter 24, and I just mentioned this. Now Jesus has gone out to preach this great sermon, this great prophetic sermon about Israel. It's not about so much the church, but it's about Israel. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and the disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. This happened when? We just mentioned that. 70 AD, Titus did that. So there's prophecy number one that's been fulfilled, okay? Now, here's another prophecy. He's talking about uh, the fig tree here in a couple places here. And the fig tree is important because the fig tree represents Israel. Israel. Now notice what he says here. He says, now learn a parable. This is talking about the second coming. All this is talking chapter 24, 25. It's all talking about the second coming. It says, verse 32. Okay, Matthew 24, verse 32. Listen to me here. It says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when its branches is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, ye, when you shall see all the things, know that it is near, even at the door. So what he's saying is, when the fig tree starts to turn green, all these things that I'm talking about are at the door. Now if something's at the door, it's what? It's closed. It's near. Okay, now... Here's the fig tree. Here's the green leaves. Rumors of wars, wars and all that stuff has always happened, right? And so we hear that stuff and we just get kind of cold to it because earthquakes have done what? They've always been. Rumors of war, they've always been. Okay? All this stuff's always been and people say, well, what's the difference now? Well, the difference is 1948. All this stuff uh, goes <coughs> has to happen during a certain period of time. It can't just happen any time. It has to happen when Israel is what? A nation again. When the fig leaf is turned green. Guess what happened in 1948? Israel becomes what? A recognized nation again. When the fig tree blooms, Israel's going to be saved. When the fig tree blooms, they're going to bow their knee and realize that He is Messiah. Right? But it's not blooming yet because they're not saved yet. Right? Not everybody that's a Jewish person or Jewish, they don't believe in the Messiah, right? But it has turned green. In other words, he says this thing started. Because all these things have to happen when, G when Israel becomes a nation again and Jerusalem becomes her capital again. And so you see that uh, these things are already starting to begin. These things are already happening. So what does that tell us? It just means it's close. It's closer today than it was yesterday. It'll be closer tomorrow. So all these things, you need to understand these things to understand kind of the end time. So, so far, are you with me? Okay? 
Jerusalem. You'll notice another thing about Jerusalem. Jerusalem, uh, during Jesus' time, of course, he was in the temple. He, he turned over the money changers, and, and we remember that. But it's also the Jerusalem was the place of his what? Triumphal entry, right? And so that's over in Matthew 21. And so uh, his crucifixion's there. And so all these things point, again, they point everything to Jerusalem uh, to kick off the events of his return. Now, uh, let me just read you something from Jeremiah 51, 47 through 50. And you don't have to turn there, but it says, Therefore, this is Jeremiah, Therefore, behold, the days come that I will do judgment upon the graven images of Babylon. And so this prophecy, right? It's talking about judgment against Babylon. Now, prophecy is always, prophecy many times is near and far. And what I mean by that is a lot of times the prophecy concerns the times that they're in, right? But it also points towards the time in the future. Okay, and that's hard to understand if you don't if you're not clear on the Bible. Some of that stuff's funny. When you see Babylon in the Bible, there's a real historical Babylon that existed. There's a real Nebuchadnezzar that existed. Everybody's right on that. Yeah. You remember that Nebuchadnezzar? Mm -hmm. uh, you see the Book of Daniel. You can read all about the Babylonian Empire and those studies and everything. But there's also another Babylon, right? And that's mentioned word. It's mentioned in Revelation. Why? Because Babylon also represents world, the flesh. It represents world powers. It, it represents all the world system that's an enemy against God. And he says, <clears throat> Images of Babylon and her whole land shall be confounded, and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. Then the heaven and the earth and all that therein shall sing for Babylon. For the spoiler shall come unto her from the north, saith the Lord. As Babylon had caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon shall fall the slain of all the earth. Yet that have escaped the sword, go away, stand not still, remember the Lord to fall off, and let Jerusalem come into your mind. You know what? That's a good verse, isn't it? He's saying, listen, no matter what's happening out there, when you see me start taking Babylonian, uh, when you start seeing the Babylonians fall before me, and they, and they, I become a cup of trembling to them, and, and I start dealing with these things. And listen, if you're God's people, it doesn't matter if you're over here and you're over there. It doesn't matter where you're at in the world. When you start seeing this thing, this is Jeremiah prophesying hundreds of centuries before. He says, you know what you need to think? You need to let Jerusalem. Come into your mind. <laughs> he said, you need to be thinking about what? Jerusalem. He just said, you need to be thinking about the Lord. You need to be thinking about... But he didn't. He said, you need... When you see all these things happen, he said, I just want you to sit down, take a load off your feet, and let Jerusalem come into your mind. Amen. Okay? So why are we thinking about... Why are we talking about Jerusalem tonight? Because I'm seeing some things out there in the world, and the Lord told me when I start seeing these things happen, to sit down for a minute and just let Jerusalem come into your mind. Because Jerusalem's going to be what? A blessing? He said, just calm down. He said, there's a couple trembling going around. He said, people passing all over. They're shaking. Everybody's fighting. Everybody's nervous. And we're having all kinds of riots. And people upset that Jerusalem uh, is the capital of Israel. That, that we're recognizing that. And he said, I want you, when you see all that, just sit down, take it easy, and just let Jerusalem come in your mind. Because you know what Jerusalem is, don't you? What do we say it meant? It meant peace, don't it? He said, just be peace. And let my city that I put my name on come into your mind. And everything you think about Jerusalem will bring peace to your mind. Okay? And so Jerusalem is something. So, uh, we've talked about that as far as the little importance of this, uh, of Jerusalem, and yet uh, it's very prominent uh, in the prophecy. Let me read you some prophecy. Now, like I was showing Sean the other day, I've got a book of all the prophecies in the Bible, and we'll kind of explain them and stuff. It's about that thick. I mean, it's amazing how much prophecy, and almost uh, most of it is already fulfilled. But let me just read you some here that I picked out that you might have already heard so that it would be kind of familiar with you. 
I'm finished saying this interesting about yeah. I laid up in bed all night thinking about it. I had to ruse them on my mind. I can tell you right now, it came into my mind. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Daniel 9 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. Hmm, good night, oh my. I'm getting blessed up here. Uh, to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince. Now, who's the Messiah, the Prince? All right then, come on, somebody ate me in that. They're going to rebuild Jerusalem. They're going to rebuild all this temple stuff. Shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now, I won't get into the 70 weeks of Daniel because I did that in Revelation and y'all left here staggering. So look, but I'll talk about that one day, the 70 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall and even in troublous or troublesome times. We're having troubled times, ain't we? He said, don't worry about that. Is I'm still going to be at rebuild Jerusalem during these troubled times. Let Jerusalem come into your mind. Micah 4, 1, 2. But in the last days, this is talking about the Lord's second coming. You know the Lord's coming back and set foot on earth. You realize that, right? Amen. That's not the rapture. The rapture, you don't set foot on earth, okay? Right. Dead in Christ, the dead in Christ arise first, right? Mm -hmm. And then those of us which remain, we gather together and meet Him in the air, right? So shall we ever be with the Lord. But He doesn't return. We go up to heaven with them. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb, the judgment seat of Christ, and all that. While well, that's going on, all hell is breaking loose down here, right? And in chapter 19, we come back. Uh, <clears throat> Satan is bound for a thousand years. Uh, uh, during that time, the, the king's millennial reign, when Jesus will reign world in Jerusalem, he'll be on the throne. He'll rule and reign right there in the seat of David, his father. Now, but in the last days, that's what he's talking about. Now, where's he going to set his foot at? The first place he's going to set his foot back to is where? Stop answering all the questions. Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives, right? Right where he did what? Preached the... All of it. This, well, y'all getting a hold of this, ain't you? You see how all this stuff goes together. That the mountain of the house of the Lord... Listen. The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. The house of the Lord is the temple of the Lord. It will be built right there on Mount Zion. He said it right here, guaranteed. Shall flow, and listen, he says, during the millennial reign, all the people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up unto the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And I will teach us, he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, that's Jerusalem, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Think about that. People are going to be coming from all over during the reign of the king, the millennial reign, 1,000 year reign. Y'all know about that, right? That's kind of very mysterious, but it's a 1,000 year reign. And all the countries and the nations, they send their emissaries to who? King Jesus. Because you know why? The Bible says this got to happen. <laughs> every knee's going to bow and every tongue to pass. And he's Lord. Amen. And they send their emissaries to Jerusalem, to the temple, to his throne. And when they come before him, every knee's bowed. And every heart's humbled before him because he's King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. And he says, you're going to rule and reign with me. My goodness, I don't know. I might be right here ruling Cameron. I'm the mayor of Cameron back in the millennium, baby. <laughs> Zechariah 2.12 And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Okay? Let me read this. Matthew 24. When you therefore see, I've never read that, the, the Daniel, the, the abomination of Daniel, Desolation appears there. He said, let him understand this. And scream it from the housetops. And don't just, hey, I'm coming back. You know all these things started. So we have a rundown here of why Jerusalem is important. Now, in our next day, we're out of time now. But <coughs> Would you like to hear some more about Jerusalem? Yeah. I can go on all about Jerusalem here. So we'll have another evening. I'll come back. And we'll try to get on out here in 1948. I'll give you some history stuff. Maybe during the, the Lord willing, if I don't. He don't get me on something else, but let Jerusalem come into your mind. Now let me tell you something that's a great encouragement to me. It always has been in the book of Psalms. And I know this is your favorite verse too. You probably got it uh, wrote on your refrigerator or something. <coughs> Psalms number two. Psalm right. number two. The Psalm of the King it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? 
The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointing. Everybody hates Jerusalem. Everybody hates Israel. Ain't that right? Yes. It's amazing to me how many people so called say themselves Christians and was upset. What's the Pope upset about Jerusalem being the capital of Israel? He ought to be jumping back flips. What's all these religious folks upset about Jerusalem? Are they crazy? You know why? That's the apostasy. It ain't real. Look out for stuff like that. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord hath, shall have them in derision. Think about that. He's just laughing. Yeah. He said, look at him down there. They're just crazy. <laughs> they think they got this thing. He said, man, I'm going to come back. Boom! I'm going to come back. <laughs> Oh, y'all gonna jump for real. <laughs> Be more than that. <laughs> then shall he speak unto them in the wrath and vex them in the sore displeasure. Verse 6. Mark that in your Bible, friend. You don't ever forget this. He said, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Amen. He says, As far as I'm concerned, he's on the throne. That's right. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, you take Washington, D.C. and every other capital, but my king's still in Jerusalem on the throne of his father David. You better believe it. Amen. That Jerusalem tonight come into your mind. Pray for the peace of Israel. Because when you pray for the peace of Israel, you're praying for Jesus to come. There'll be no peace that He comes. That's why He said to pray for Him. The city of our God. And He's on the throne. Amen. Let's stand. Hey man, we got something to play, brother. I'm so excited about the roof. Listen here. Maybe you just need to come down. The Bible says, why don't you come and pray for the peace of Israel? Because when you're doing that, you're praying that Jesus will come quickly. John said, even so, Lord. He said, come on. He's seen it all already. And you'd think he would have said, he would have been astonished. You'd think he'd say, well, Lord, give me, a, he said, Lord, give me a little bit more time. He said, no, he didn't say that. He sang all of it. He said, you know what? Come on. He said, I come quickly. He said, you're not quick enough for me. Come on. Right now, come on. Maybe you just want to come down and thank the Lord. Pray for Jerusalem tonight. <clears throat> Maybe you just want to come down and let Jerusalem spend a little time at all to let Jerusalem come into your mind. <coughs> place of God's throne, the place of God's temple, the place where He put His name on, the place of God's people, the place of God's salvation, the place of, uh, where God saved you from your sins. It's the place of Calvary. It's the place where He did all His miracles. And listen, let Jerusalem come into your mind tonight. In these turbulent times, He said, just let Jerusalem come in your mind and have some peace tonight. I just pray for peace. There's peace in Jerusalem. Now you know I told you in the beginning there's a there's Jerusalem that there is, and there's Jerusalem above, and there's a Jerusalem to come. That's good, isn't it? Now, maybe you just say, you know what? I need that peace tonight from Jerusalem above. You know what that is? That's salvation. That's what he's talking about there. He said, look, there's a king up, around, up in the throne of heaven. And listen, that, he was making a covenant with you. And why don't you come and receive that covenant from Jerusalem above and get some peace. Maybe you had a storm. There's some storms. We talked about some storms this morning. There's some storms going around here. There might be some storms in your life. The Bible says when you see all this turmoil around you, let's let Jerusalem come into your mind. Isn't that good? Let peace come into your heart. Everybody else is troubled. Everybody else is upset. He said, when you see all those things happen, just let Jerusalem come into your mind. Isn't that good? That's wonderful. That's wonderful stuff. Uh, let's just have a word of prayer right quick. Lord, I just thank you, Lord Father. Oh, what a great city. The city of our God. And Lord, we do pray for the peace of Israel, Lord Father. We're excited, Lord Father. What what's going on, how you're moving the, all the pieces together, Lord. Yeah. And you just sit up and, and, and you look at us and, and you wonder, what are we thinking? What are we doing? 
And you're so merciful to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord Father, for all that you do for us, Lord Father. We love you tonight. And you're so good to us tonight. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother David Morgan if he just closes in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you and praise you, Lord, for the goodness to us. And thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your love, Lord. And just thank you for the opportunity we have to come to your word explain to us tonight, God. I pray that you impact our lives, that we would have the rhythm on our, on our mind, Lord, on our mind, Lord, to be looking and be ready. Uh, we ask it all in Christ's name and for your sake. Amen. Amen.